All right, several things going on over the course of this week um, that we need to make you aware of. Don't forget when the service is over today, the Life South Bloodmobile will be parked out front. Um, we, there is a tremendous need for blood, and so if you can give, please do stay and give. Uh, and uh, it's an awesome opportunity even for our church to be a witness. So if you can stay and give after service is over today. Ladies Bible study is this coming Thursday evening at 6 o'clock. So ladies, you're invited to join us for Bible study. Join the ladies for Bible study at 6 o'clock Thursday night here in the Family Life Center. This coming Saturday night is the City Fall Festival. Uh, we are going to be participating in that. We will have a booth uh, from our church there. Um, I hope that you brought some candy in with you this morning. We still need some more. You can drop it off uh, tomorrow or Tuesday or by Wednesday morning if you can here at the church office. We are expecting a lot of children for that this coming Saturday evening. It runs from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. And we need some of our folks to just come out with big smiles on your face to welcome and greet folks, let them know you're glad they're there and uh, just an opportunity for us to be a witness in our community. So if you can join us Saturday night, just be over there about 545, 6 o'clock, and uh, join us for that, and please bring in candy. We will be bagging up that candy um, Wednesday morning, so if you'd like to come by about 10 o'clock or so Wednesday morning and help us bag that candy up, uh, we could use that help. Someone's waving at me. I can't hear what she said, but that's not unusual. It says, what? Tuesday. Yeah, it's not Tuesday the 17th, but uh, yes, thank you, Justine, if you're paying attention. But uh, Saturday evening, of course, the fall festival for the city, and we do need some more candy, so please bring it in. Stop by the office uh, tomorrow or Tuesday and uh, drop off some more candy. We are also anticipating beginning to open some of our on-site ministries uh, here at First Baptist. We plan to begin Sunday school two weeks from today on the 25th. Those classes will be in their normal Sunday morning classes. We will begin with some refreshments that morning, so you can join us for that about 9.15 or so. And uh, looking forward to our Bible study time. We are planning to begin our Wednesday night um, activities on Wednesday night, November the 4th. We will not be doing dinner yet, but uh, we'll probably begin dinner after the first of the year. But we will begin our Wednesday night activities coming up first Wednesday night in November. Second Sunday night in November the 8th, we'll begin our Sunday night Bible study once again. So looking forward to that and at some point as regulations begin to ease uh, we hope to move back into our sanctuary for worship but uh, we're just going to have to wait on uh, state and county regulations about that our senior adults are going to be uh, passing out thanksgiving baskets in our community this year instead of hosting our usual senior adult thanksgiving banquet and uh, so we're looking forward to that also, our shoebox ministry store will be open at the conclusion of the service today. You can pack a shoebox and uh, have an opportunity to share Christ with a child somewhere in the world. So take advantage of that. We've had a lot of folks who've taken advantage of that. We still need about another 80 to 90 more shoeboxes to pack. So if you can stay and pack a shoebox, we would appreciate that very much. These announcements are on our weekly handout. If you didn't get one today, make sure you get one before you go so you can be reminded of all of our events and things that are coming up. We want to take a few minutes to welcome one another this morning and give you an opportunity to greet one another. If you're comfortable with a physical type greeting, uh, you're welcome to. If you're more comfortable just waving, giving a fist bump, smiling, that's great, whatever you feel comfortable with. But I invite you to stand with a smile on your face anyway, and let's share a welcome song together. As you're going back to your places, you may be seated.
Before we have a word of prayer together this morning, I do want to mention one, one special prayer request that uh, is not on our weekly prayer list. Um, they are available on the table in the back there. Uh, you're probably missing Perry and Donna this morning. Donna's mother fell off her porch, uh, broke her leg, uh, is in surgery or had surgery yesterday on that. So uh, Donna is, of course, in route, in route up to the farm in Kentucky. So do remember Donna's mom in your prayer time as well. Let's go to the Lord this morning. Father, we are grateful that we get to gather and share together in your name this morning. Lord, we are grateful that your presence has come to this place in the person of the Holy Spirit today. And we gather as a group of people today, and I know we've come for many different reasons, but I trust that we've come to worship you today. That somehow we'll be able to put out all the things that are in our hearts and minds and for the next few minutes be able to focus on you. I pray that as we sing this morning, it'll be from hearts that genuinely worship you. I pray that as we share time in your word together today, that we would hear from you today and that we'd open our spiritual ears. Bless the time that we have together as we worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join our hearts in worship this morning. We're going to sing Redeemed.
Amen. He is the God who gives us victory. Last week we looked at an army that had victory. Today we will look at an individual that had victory from God. And I invite you to open your Bibles once again to the book of 2 Kings, this week chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. We have been looking at a series of life's questions and using some of the Old Testament lessons the Israelite nation learned as our illustration. We will do that once again today. Uh, Perhaps not one of the most important of life's questions, but one you have, I'm sure, asked or been asked before, how do I look? And we're going to look at it from a standpoint of looking at it spiritually this morning. 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse number 1. And when you find that place in your copy of God's Word, I would invite you out of reverence to God's Word to bow your head with me this morning. I would also invite you to bow your heart before God. And take the next few moments of quiet meditation Invite God to speak to your heart this morning. Take a few moments of silent meditation. Then I'll lead us in a word of prayer and read our text. Heavenly Father, it is you that gives us victory. Lord, you saved the Israelites as we read about them in the history of the Old Testament. And then your son Jesus Christ would come to earth from heaven and give his life on the cross of Calvary so that we could have victory over sin and over death. Lord, I thank you that you have given us your word today, and I pray that as we examine it today, that we would listen to what you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. One of the fascinating stories in the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 5, the Bible says, Now Naaman was captain of the host of the king of Syria. He was a great man with his king. He was honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto Naaman's wife, Would to God that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would cure him of his leprosy. And one went in and told the king, saying, Thus and thus said the maid who was out of the land of Israel. Now the king of Syria said, Go now, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And he departed, and he took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come to you, Behold, I have sent with it Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. It came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter, he tore his clothes and he said, Am I God to kill, to make alive, that this man sends to me to cure someone from their leprosy? Now consider, I pray you, and see how he seeks a quarrel against me. And it was that when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him now come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots, and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will come again to you, and you will be clean. But Naaman was angry. He went away, 
And he said, Behold, I thought surely he would come out to me. He would stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, strike his hand over the place, and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar rivers in Damascus better than all the rivers in Israel? Can I wash in them and be clean? So he went away in a rage. But his servants came near and spoke unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? How much easier then that he says to you, Wash and be clean. And so he went down, he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan River according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came like again unto the flesh of a child, and he was clean. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. We've been looking at some of those questions, questions in the past few weeks like how much is it? Last week, are you blind? Learning lessons from the Israelite nation on how you and I should live. Last week, we looked at Elisha and the Syrian army that had come to Israel. And now we read about the general of that Syrian army today who has leprosy. I'm going to share some points with you today. They're all in the form of a question. There are nine points today. I know what you're thinking. Oh, my goodness. We're never going to get out of this place today. Nine points in the form of a question, each one I trust designed to make you think about what God has for you today. Some of the important questions that we have in Life. For example, here's some of the really important questions of life. It all begins with the one that's been from eternity past. What is the meaning of life? You ever have anybody ask you that question and you just went, uh, 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 uh. A lot more intelligent people than me have tried to answer that question. What is the meaning of life? How about this one? How would you describe love? Well, I understand what love is. I've experienced love. But how do you describe it? How about this difficult question of life? Does this dress make me look fat? By the way, I can help you with that answer, guys. The wrong answer is it's not the dress. That's not the right answer. Naaman, in our story today, is a general. He is the general of the Syrian army. The Syrian army is an enemy of Israel. Naaman is called an honorable and a great man. <clears throat> he is a good military leader. He is an incredible general. <clears throat> the Bible even tells us that he is an honorable man. But they invade Israel. And while they are there, they capture a young woman, the young woman of our story, the maid, and they take her from her home, and they take her back to Syria, and she is made to be Naaman's wife's servant. But while she is there, she tells Naaman's wife, if Naaman was in my country, there is a prophet there. And that prophet has a direct connection with God, and he could heal Naaman's leprosy. And, of course, the king of Syria sends Naaman and a large gift to the king of Israel to say, cure him. The king of Israel says, I can't do it. I'm not God. <clears throat> he tears his clothes. Remember, in the Old Testament, that's a sign of something desperately wrong on the inside. He tore his clothes, and Elisha the prophet says, Why have you torn your clothes? Send him to me, and I will show him that there really is a prophet in Israel. And, of course, Naaman goes. He is told he has to wash in the Jordan River seven times. He doesn't like the answer. He gets mad, and he turns around to leave and go back home. His servants say, What are you doing? Stop and think about this. And he does. And he washes in the Jordan River, and his leprosy is gone. 
wow, what a neat story. But God didn't put it there in the life of Israel, and he didn't put it there for you and I just so we could read a story on Sunday morning, but because he has principles that he wants to teach us. So here they are. They're going to go fast. If you're writing them down, be ready. Question number one. You mean God used the enemy to accomplish his will? God uses the enemy? God uses a bad person to accomplish his will? It's one of the questions people have asked many times. David asked the question. Habakkuk asked the question. If you want to know more on this one, read the book and study the book Habakkuk this week. God reveals to Habakkuk that he is going to use the Assyrians to judge the northern kingdom of Israel. And Habakkuk's answer is, wait a minute, they're worse than we are. And then God says, and I'm going to use the Babylonians to judge the southern kingdom of Judah. And the question again comes, wait a minute, they're more evil than we are. And God says, this is how I'm going to do it. For nations rise and fall, and I am God. And by the way, we learned last week that God has a way of doing things that are not always in line with how you and I think he might do it. But know this, God still uses the leadership in the world to accomplish his purpose. I believe he is still doing it today. God will use the enemy to accomplish his person. Second one, why do bad things happen to good people? We've answered this question and addressed it several times before in sermons. Why do bad things happen to good people? In our case today, we have two people. Naaman, Though he's the general of the enemy army, the Bible says he's an honorable man. He's a good general, but he has leprosy. And I can imagine that he might ask that question. I'm a good guy. I work hard. Why does God allow me to have leprosy? But in our story today, we find someone that's an even better illustration. And that is this young maid. When the Bible refers to her as a little maid, it refers to her as a very young maid, which in this particular case probably means she's 9, 10, 11 years old. And think about it. An army has come to her homeland, and they have kidnapped and snatched her from her family, and they have taken her back to their country, and she is now living in a land that she doesn't know the language and she is living in the home as a servant girl to Naaman's wife. And I don't know if you can find anybody outside the person of Job who could ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? After all, Job was an adult. This was a little girl. And yet, you and I can look at the story and we could dig into this deeper. But here's the point you and I need to know. God has a plan and a purpose and he is going to use this young maid who's had something terrible happen to her to accomplish his will. And sometimes God allows bad things to happen to good people and he has an incredible purpose in all of it. What an important thing. One of the devotions coming up this week is about seeing problems or opportunities. Which one will you see them as? Problems or opportunities? By the way, God has sent the rain, so you don't even want to leave here for nine points. Ha! Question number three. Why should I pray for the people I don't like? I don't know about you, I find some people very easy to pray for. The people that I really love, it's easy for me to pray for them. People I don't really like, it's not as easy to pray for them. In this particular case, we've got a young lady who is praying for the enemy. The very general who's led a campaign into her land. We're not even told what's happened to her family. We can only guess or imagine how bad it was. And she is taken away, and yet what is her response? I wish, I wish that my boss, Naaman, 
could get to the prophet in Israel because God would cure him. You and I need to take an important lesson from that today because it's easy to pray for the people you care about. It's really tough to pray for the people that you don't like and especially the ones that come after you. Jesus told us to love our enemies and to pray for them. You and I have a problem, and that is the problem between reconciliation and revenge. When someone harms us, our first response is often revenge, when our response ought to be reconciliation. I know how difficult that is. I know what a struggle that is. And I can tell you where you stand on that between you and God right now. All you've got to do is look back over your life over the last four or five or six weeks or months, and if somebody has hurt you, what was your initial response? I love them, and I'm going to pray for them. Or, oh, I would. you know what your response would be. And one of the first challenges for you and I today is to make a determination that my character needs to change so that when something bad happens, even when it's somebody that's hurt me, that I respond in, I want the best for them because I want them to know the Lord. You check your heart. Revenge? or reconciliation. Question number four, <clears throat> what are you willing to pay for what's important to you? We, we asked two weeks ago, how much is it? Very similar question, what are you willing to pay for what's important to you? Even for the king of Syria, he's willing to pay a great sum to have his general cured from his leprosy. I can't even imagine what Naaman wanted for his leprosy to be cured. Because he had everything else in life. He had a successful career. He was considered an honorable man. He had a wife. But he had leprosy. While everything else may have been going good for him, that one thing was going really bad. And I wonder what he'd be willing to pay for that. And the king of Syria sends him and a great gift to the king of Israel to have his leprosy cured. Uh, by the way, let me just remind you what that really cost Naaman. You've got to understand the story. You and I look at it from a financial standpoint. And we realize, hey, you know what? Naaman's not really paying for it. It's the king who's sending them out. But you have now asked your general, Naaman, to go where? To Israel. Which is what? The enemy. And to go back to the place you've already been to, you've raided and you've captured and taken prisoners back with you. Now I want you to go back to that place. We already know from the response of the king of Israel that he's already thinking about revenge. But Naaman has to be willing to go back to the very place that could be an end for him. What are you willing to pay for what's most important to you? You and I already know that our checkbook and our calendar reveals what's important to us. I want you to know how important you are to God today. And the reason or the way you find out how important you are to God is what's God willing to pay for you? See, I'm, I'm fairly convinced that if I was kidnapped and taken away, there's some people who would probably get together a fair amount of money to get me back. I'm not going to ask you what amount you'd give. But I know there's a few people that would say, yeah, we'd, we'd give whatever it took to get you back. I also know there's some people that would be like, yeah, I got some change, I'll throw it in. And I also know there's some people that would just say, 
finally. I don't got to listen to the guy anymore. What are you willing to pay? How do I know how valuable I am? I can tell how valuable I am by, one, what people are willing to do for me. By the way, this applies in a whole lot of areas in our life. Mom and Dad, you want to know how important your kids are to you? By how much time you spend with them. You want to know how important someone is to you? Look around and see how much time they spend with you. God paid the highest price. He gave his only son, Jesus, for you. Wow. When you stop and think about that, that God loves you so much, that God values so much, that he's willing to pay the ultimate price just for you. And if you're willing to accept that gift, that price, God will forgive your sin, adopt you as his child. It isn't because we deserve it, because we don't. But that's how much God values you. And if you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, you've never accepted what God has done for you, you can do that today. That's how much God values you. What are you willing to pay for what is important to you? Question number five. This is my favorite one. Look at verse number seven. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he tore his clothes and he said, What am I, God? You better look and see. And the end of the verse it says, Watch carefully, for the king of Syria has a quarrel against me and he's looking to trap me. Question number five, what is your motivation? What is your motivation? The king of Israel is convinced that the king of Syria has ulterior motives against him. And he sent Naaman ahead. And he wants to see what I can do because he's looking for an excuse just to come and attack again. And the king is convinced that the king of Syria's motivation is evil. Huh. There are times I wish that I could read people's motivation. You and I can't know what the motivation of someone's heart is. We can get ideas by how much time they spend with us, by whether they want to be with us, by those kind of things, but we don't know what their motivation is. But I'll tell you something about motivation. God knows your motivation. God knows the motivation of your heart right now. God knows right now whether you care about his word is saying or not. God knows the motivation of your heart about the people you came in contact with this past week. He knows what your motivation is. God knows the motivation of why you're even here this morning. God knows the motivation behind all of the things that you do. You and I can fool people, but you can't fool God. And one of the key questions today is, what's your motivation? Why are you here? What is it that you want out of life? What is it that you're willing to pay for what you want? God knows and understands your motivation right now. Verse 11, we find another question, number six. Do you know who I am? That's a great question, isn't it? I love it. Look at verse number 11. We know that when Naaman gets to Elisha, and Elisha sends a messenger out and says, just go tell him to wash in the Jordan River seven times and his leprosy will be gone. And what is Naaman's response? Notice it there in verse number 11. Naaman was angry, and he turned to leave, and he said, Behold, I love this part of the verse, and unless you spend some time really digging into Scripture, you might miss this. Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me. Stop right there, because we've always read the rest of it, 
and thought that's what his motivation was. But here's his first motivation. I thought he would come out and tell me. Now, you and I might not grasp that, but I want you to know who Naaman was. What did Naaman do for a living? Okay, I'm going to give you a hint. He's a general. What did Naaman do for a living? He was a general. What does a general mean? You're the top dog. You're the top dog. If you know anything about the military, you also realize that in the military there is a thing called hierarchy. Yeah. I don't get what all them different stripes and badges and things mean. I grasp a little bit of it. But I've watched enough episodes of Gomer Pyle to understand the hierarchy in the military. That if someone has a higher position, a higher rank, you understand what that means. And it wouldn't matter whether you were big and tough and could grab that drill sergeant around the neck and squeeze his head off. Yeah, ah, you don't do it because he's got rank. And if a lieutenant or a colonel or a major or a general walks in, you understand hierarchy in the military. This is a general. You got to understand his first problem. He gets to the house of Elisha, and Elisha sends out a messenger to talk to him. Are you getting it? And he's angry. Why? Because in his life, he understands I'm a general. And if you're going to send somebody to give me a message, it had better be a general. I want the top dog. And instead, Elisha sits in the house and sends out one of his little services. He says, just go and tell him, Washington, Jordan River, seven times, you'll be okay. And that infuriates him. And his first response is, do you know who I am? Now, I don't know about you, but at that point... I'm not God because if I'd have been God, I'd have said what? Do you know who I am? Bink! You're done. Or I'd have picked him up in my hand and said, would you rather hike the 20 miles or do you want me to toss you the 20 miles to the Jordan River? But he's a general and his response is, do you know who I am? You know, every one of us deals with that awful thing called pride. Naaman did. Remember, God knows the motivation of your heart. He knows the level of your pride right now. If your soul was laid bare before God right now, what would it look like? Would he see pride? Would he see a lack of motivation? You know what he'd see in some people on Sunday mornings? If he opened up his, our hearts before him, I believe that one of God's first responses would be, that's okay, you don't want to be here, Go. Yesterday we played with the grandkids. <sighs> it's really tough when you get to the grandkids' house. You go in and sit down in front of the television and the Gators are playing football. Well, they started out playing football. And you're watching the game. And your grandson and granddaughter come up and stand in front of you and go, I thought you came to play with us. And I said, I did. <laughs> and then the response of, well, then fine. We'll play with Grammy.
pretty simple for them to recognize the motivation of my heart, wasn't it? If you think that was easy, God knows the motivation of your heart right now. He knows the level of your pride right now. Question number seven in verse number 12. <laughs> this is my favorite one. I made this one up. Go ahead and put it up there. Do I look stupid? Anybody here? How many have ever said that? Ask that question. Uh, some of you ought to ask it. I love it. Look at verse number 12. Look at verse number 12. First, he's angry because he doesn't come out. You know, then he's angry because in verse number 11, God doesn't do some really giant miraculous thing like him come out and go, I call the miracle down from God. And, and his leprosy is gone. That's what he wants. But you see, God does things different. And then he gets angry. And in his anger, he responds, do I look stupid? I've come from Damascus. I can tell you two rivers that are way better than the Jordan River. We got better rivers there. If all I had to do was take a bath and I'd be well, I'd already done it there. Do I look stupid? You think you're going to tell me this to go and get in a river and just get in water? Are you kidding? What do you think? I don't ever take a bath? Do I look stupid? I'm not only not God, but I'm not Elisha, because you know what I'd have said at that point? Why, yes, you do. Because God's revealed your heart. Ouch. How do you really look before God right now? No, God, I do things my way. Man, huh. I got rivers better in Damascus. Now you tell me go 20 miles and bathe in the Jordan River. Pfft. He leaves in a rage. Then a question that I am asked often, because I need to be asked it often. Number eight, verse 13. Will you stop and think? Will you stop and think? We all know what anger can do to us. And we all understand that we're even taught from when we were little, when something makes you mad, stop and do what? Count. Stop and count to ten. One, two, three. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It didn't work. It didn't work. Stop and think. We all know it applies in anger. We've all had experiences in our life where we've said things when we were angry. We've done things when we were angry. And we can understand that concept, that principle, stop and think in that. But I'll tell you, it's a biblical principle that you and I ought to think of many times every day. Stop and think. Stop and think. Stop. Think. And in his rage, as he heads back to Damascus and back to Syria, even those who are under him are more intelligent than he is. And they say to him, stop. And by the way, it's unique that they don't call him sir or general because they respond to him personally and they say, you've been like a father to us. When they use that concept, it's not just as a military, but it's really a unique reference that says, we've watched you live your life. 
And you're not only an honorable man when you're a general, but you're an honorable man in life. And now you respond this way. Stop and think. Stop. Stop. And they ask him a question. They say, Naaman, if Elisha had said to you, you've got to trek by yourself for two weeks in the mountains, and you've got to slay a dragon when you get to the top of the mountain, and if you do that, you'll be cured from your leprosy. Wouldn't you do that? And the response would be, yes. Whatever I had to do to be cured of my leprosy, I'd be willing to do it. I've already left home and gone to the enemy. Wouldn't you be willing to do some heroic thing if it meant your leprosy would be cured? And all he's asked you to do is go to the Jordan River and dip in the water. Stop and think. Wow. It's tragic what happens to our intellect when we're emotional. When I'll tell you the next time it comes, stop and think. Last question, verse number 13, or verse number 14. <laughs> Back to the beginning, how do I look? <laughs> In verse 14, he agrees with them, and he says, you're right. Once I stop and think about it, I'm willing to do whatever it'll take. He goes to the Jordan River. He dips seven times. And his leprosy is gone and he's healed. I can imagine him standing there, coming out of the water after the seventh time in there going, Look. Look. How does my face look? How do I look? <laughs> Naaman, you look like a young man. God's healed you. How do I look? How do you and I look before God? Naaman's pride from who do you think, do you know who I am and who do you think I am? To his anger, he stops and thinks. And one of the most unique things about it is even with all of the obstacle, God still chooses to heal him. That's one of the best parts for me. God should have been done working for, on me a long time ago, but I'm glad he's not. What's your motivation today? What does your pride look like before God? When you stand before God, what will you look like? How will God see you? Well, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the very treasure that God paid for you. The ultimate price and sacrifice is Son Jesus Christ. If you put your faith and trust in Him, you've asked God to forgive your sin and you've trusted Him and given Him your life, God won't see you as a sinner, but God will see you as His child. And God will welcome you to heaven. If you don't know you're going to spend eternity in heaven, we have our invitation in just a moment. I invite you to come. I'll be standing right here. Just let me know. Pastor, I don't know, but I'd like to know. I'd like to settle it today. We'll take a few minutes of your time before you go today. Sit down and share with you how you can know that. To my brother, sister in Christ, how does your heart look on the scale of revenge to reconciliation? If revenge is usually your first response, 
God needs to do a work in your heart. How does your life look bared before God in your pride? Maybe God needs to do a work in your heart today, and you need to just come to the altar and say, God, I just need to be humble because I let me get in the way too much. What's your motivation? How do you really look before God this morning? Would you bow your heads in prayer with me today? Heads bowed. I'm not sure how God spoke to your heart this morning. Maybe this morning you need to put your faith and trust in God's Son, Jesus Christ, because you're not sure you're going to spend eternity in heaven. You see, Naaman had to come the way God said. Naaman knew better ways, but none of them would have worked. He had to come God's way. What a picture. And Jesus Christ is God's way. Are you willing to come for that? Brother, sister in Christ, maybe this morning you need to come and check that motivation. Maybe you need to come and check that pride. Maybe this morning you need to come and check that anger. That's between you and God this morning. Maybe you want to come and pray for somebody this morning. Always grateful that our folks do that. Father, I pray that you bless our invitation time now. I pray that we'd be willing to be obedient in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed this morning. As our instrumentalist begins to play, our invitation is open, and I invite you to come this morning. Between you and God, come. What's your motivation? How do you look? Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. Grateful to be able to share God's word today. Don't forget our shoebox uh, ministry table will be open when the service is over. Also, uh, youth, Pastor Rod needs to meet with uh, those who are contemplating, thinking about winter camp. Need to have a short meeting in the youth room as soon as we dismiss. So youth parents uh, need to head that way when it's done so you can get uh, information about that and when service is over. Also, the blood mobile is out there and uh, ready to take your donations. And uh, we still need more candy. Is his office full? Is there still room in his office? Still room for candy in his office. Folks, we got a lot of kids coming. The last thing I want to do is stand out there with a the big sign that says, we love you, First Baptist. Sorry, we ran out of candy. You don't get in. We need some more candy. Drop it off the next couple of days. And if you're interested in coming to help us, bag it on Wednesday morning. Show up about 10, 1030, and give us a hand with that. Let's have a closing word of prayer. Father, thank you that you love us, that you are our victory, that you are willing to lift us out of the sea, that like the Egyptians, like the Israelites came out of Egypt, and like Naaman went into the promised land and you cured him. Lord, thank you for being here with us today. Bless us as we go in Jesus' name. Amen.